All right, so welcome everybody to this uh, um, event of the IBM series. Today we have the pleasure to host uh, Bela Bodev, uh, who is a professor of chemistry in uh, uh, in University of St Andrews in uh, in the UK, and um, so he is a big name in the in the EPR community. He was trained in EPR in Frankfurt by Thomas Prisner. Uh, and then he went to Leiden University with a uh, uh, with a Marie Curie fellowship, and then uh, uh, he moved to St Andrews in the School of Chemistry, uh, where uh, he is uh, using EPR uh, for a variety of uh, studying, especially related to spin labeling. And this is exactly what he's going to talk about today uh, with his uh, tutorial. So uh, yeah, uh, thanks for accepting our invitation, and the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you for the kind invitation and um, putting this together. I, I realized um, that uh, I'm doing many things and spin labeling uh, is a part of what we do, but I'm not sure um, that there are probably other people who have stronger expertise in this. So I just decided to keep this really on a level um, for people who don't do spin labeling. So um, let's see if the participants count drops now but uh, this is really meant to be sort of in the sense for uh, the general EPR spectroscopist on a level I would basically expect it on the summer school or, or, or um, something similar so um, don't don't expect too much uh, intricate detail thank you for the kind invitation that came with quite a, um, a wish list which I just reframed and take as an outline here so basically um what I try to do is basically answer the questions that that are given to me by the um, committee in, in a on a not too specialized way. So the first question would be when to use what kind of label, how to choose spin labeling sites, both in the sense that I get the information I want, but also that I don't disturb the function of the system that I label, because this is one of the questions we get always asked. How can we make sure that the system we study, which is a perturbed system, is still relevant for the system we want to know about. Uh, some aspects of sample preparation um, on a, again, quite quite general level. Uh, what we think um, about data analysis um, in, in this case and analysis in terms of structure and dynamics of the biomolecule. And then in the end, and that for that I will use examples, how the resulting da data can be used to confirm or, or reject a, a hypothesis. Um, I'll start with, with some, some perspective and context. So historically, spin labeling is actually quite old. So the, the original uh, work here in, in PNAS from, from McConnell, which, uh, who's a well-known name in EPR, um, basically introduced um, the, the label into, um, into biomolecules. But the, the fact that it's mostly exploited today is to do this specifically to a site, and that goes uh, goes back to to Wayne Hubble, who had in the in the late eighties uh, and and in the nineteen ninety seminal papers, where basically what was happening was that the spin label was attached to a specific residue in the sequence of a protein, and with that, I don't only have um, a a label on my molecule somewhere, but I, I can control where I put my label and with that obviously derive much more useful information from that. And so um, what, uh, how does this work? And uh, I'm, I'm trained as a chemist. I had kind of a little bit exposure to biological work, but um, I know that EPR has also quite a few uh, practitioners from physics and material sciences. So uh, I'll go back to the basics, so to say, that we're basically, the, the site-directed spin labeling is based on the central dogma of molecular biology. And that is that our DNA encodes all the information for all the biomachinery that kind of drives us every, every day. That is transcribed into RNA, messenger RNA, and that is then uh, used to be translated into proteins. So basically every protein we produce in the lab recombinantly is basically through, through this way. And now we can basically exploit the fact that we have three letter codes encoding for every of the amino acids. And we can basically just swap that out um, through techniques I don't want to go into detail in, but 
well, basically it's usually mutagenic PCR, um, that you swap that out for cysteine and then use the unique chemistry of the cysteine. Um, and then basically um, I can have this residue replacing any other residue inside my protein. This is obviously um, restricted to proteins, so labeling of other biomolecules is much more difficult because of that. But I'll basically stick here mainly to the to the case of spin labeled um, spin labeled protein, and um, you can even uh, nowadays buy there's commercial suppliers who, who provide you synthetic DNA, so you could even uh, buy your mutant in if you wanted to do that. So now um, knowing that, um, I can then. After I have made my 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 cysteine, and that is the only natural amino acid that has a, a terminal SH group, so a thiol, the homolog to an alcohol, so that is specifically reactive to certain um, other um, functional groups, and the most commonly used spin label here is this MTSL. So um, this um, um, uh, MTSL. So the the group here um, has basically an inbuilt leaving group and the SH when it's reduced to S minus basically just does a substitution here and forms this disulfide bond. And that is very specific and you have very little in, in common cases, very little off target reaction. So by introducing the sulfur to the position, the cysteine to the position where you want to have your label and using this reagent, you get very specific um, labeling. There's others, so there's uh, will only discuss a little bit around those where you have um for example this this uh, yoda cetamide that doesn't form a sulfur sulfur bond and is more robust once it's on but it's harder to get on uh, there's maleimido there's others which have shorter tethers but a little bit more fragile um and we, we, we played around with those a little but they are these are all specifically reacting to um to the uh, sulfur of a cysteine so, as I said, nitroxides are very common in MTSL, I think is the most common of the nitroxides, but this whole concept, and that's what I will largely limit myself to, is based on proteins that can be recombinantly produced. So, basically, you have to be able to make your sample through this approach of um, um, uh, the, um, the overexpression of a mutated protein. Um, and if you have a cysteine that sits somewhere in your protein and that you want to keep, that's a problem because obviously um, that will react with your spin label. So there's alternatives um, to that and, and, and I will discuss that. But within the, the realm of proteins you want to make um, and that don't have cysteines that are relevant, that you need to keep, um, then you're, you're usually good. And that's a very common standard workflow. So um, the the first question is when to use which kind of stim, spin label. And I will limit myself for this to that what we do in the lab, which is pulse therapy spectroscopy. Um, there's lots of nice things you can do with the spin label already in a CW spectrometer. Polarity, accessibility, local dynamics, there are specialized probes for uh, pH and other things. Um, I will not into that, but really for pulse there polar spectroscopy, there, there's four main players. I mean, the MTSL is the biggest of all players, but um, and and um, this uh, Galant, um, this review by Galato and Bordigno actually very nicely um, shows that. So I decided to steal the figure um, because it's Creative Commons. Um, <clears throat> so you have the nitroxides um, that are very versatile and um, are. are quite good in also reporting and dynamics. And then you have this copper double his, I'll kind of go into a little detail about that later. That is good because <clears throat> it is actually not connected to a sulfur. So that is one of the, of basically the, the only one of the main players, I would say, who, that you can use if you want to, to retain cysteines. And um, because a copper spectrum is way broader, then um, the, the nitroxide spectrum, it basically takes faster dynamics to, to motionally average, and it's thus more sensitive to different time scales of motion. So the two complement each other. That has been shown by, by, by work by the um, Saxena group. Uh, so then um, in cell becomes more and more popular. Um, and uh, there is a, a lot of work trying to get proteins 
labeled into cells and surviving long enough to actually look at proteins into, into the native context in the cell. Um, and there the nitroxide um, has the problem of both the spin bearing group being reduced and becoming diamagnetic and not very useful for EPR anymore, but also the linker, especially the disulfide linker becomes quite labile. Um, so there's there's tritol and uh, gadolinium, which have both been demonstrated as well as decorated versions of the nitroxide that are more bespoke and harder to, to get, um, um, have been demonstrated in cell. Um, I will not talk about in cell either today and not about gadolinium because we don't didn't do any uh, gadolinium work yet. Um, but I'll show that um, the tritol has also actually the advantage of being um, quite, quite sensitive. So what you can do is can use cysteine and gadolinium nitroxide or tritol. You can use a double histidine um, and use then this, um, this copper chelate, but you can also use native sites. So if your protein has a native cysteine that you could exploit, it has a native metal center that's paramagnetic or can be substituted by something paramagnetic, um, flavin radicals um, and all, all these sort of, sort of, sorts of things, kind of um, uh, the, the Prominent example would be the tyrosyl radical in RNR, where basically um, Marina Benati has done a lot of work on it, and these these kinds of um, kinds of things. Um, as I, th that I mentioned, that I mentioned as well, um, and basically that that's some, the main point I want to want to say here. When to choose what, I would always if. If I can start with the nitroxide uh, because that just works and we have most of the benchmarking data. If I want to um, look at narrow, uh, small distance changes, if I want to retain cysteines, then copper becomes uh, very interesting. If I want to go in cell, then I need gadolinium or, or, or tritol, uh, and tritol is also very helpful for sensitivity. Um, so this is just shown to emphasize that um, the methanthiosulfonate, the MTSL label, has here um, these rotatable bonds in the backbone. And what that leads to is that even if my protein that I label is static, and remember we want information about the protein and not about the label, at least in most cases, um, then the rotamer distribution around these bonds here, that will um, give us a, a definite dif distance distribution width and that width is smaller um, if, I, if I use these copper labels. And the rationale behind this is I have fewer bonds to rotate around, but I also have both histidines that coordinate the copper here to be standing here in this cis fashion. So it's basically stapled on and cannot uh, move very much. So the um, short-linked malamide slim label um, that, we, that we basically use in collaboration with the Schiemann group, that has the advantage of um, having a tritol that is reduction stable for itself, having a narrow line, and that it's tethered in a way there's only one sulfur through the malamide, so um, it's also not reductively cleaved off. And I'll show an, show an example later. But these are the, the main things that, that feature in the, in the um, research we do here. Um, so... <clears throat> How do we choose the spin labeling site? So our spin labeling for, for sure should not alter the structure or function of the protein. And that means that ideally you have an, a type of assay to test after labeling. So basically if the protein is supposed to do some catalysis as an enzyme, um, then test if it still does that. If it's supposed to bind something, test if it still does that. If it's just structural, there are methods uh, just as circular dactrism or other things, and um, just to see if the structure is still similar. So um, there may be reasons why you want to study a perturbed protein, but the most often when I present work to people who do, don't do spin labeling, I will be asked, how do you make sure that the system you labeled is still representative of the unlabeled system? So this is a an, an very important point here. Um, what we've tried and do is two sites based on, uh, on a hypothesis to test and on available structures. And um, so basically I need, I mean, Blue Sky's research is great, but um, if I do an experiment, it's even better if I have a hypothesis and anticipated outcome uh, 
by rather than basically just mixing stuff together and um, uh, looking what what happens. So um, available structures. So the you can just go to the protein database um, and and just uh, look for structures. So if we use GB1. There's tens and probably hundreds of structures in there. You can download the coordinates. You can visualize the structures. Um, but a lot of us do research in systems that is no structure available because that's why the it's interesting and it's, it, um, and people want to know more about it. But if you actually don't have a structure, probably most of you have heard from, from of, of AlphaFold. So AlphaFold has by now predicted um, for almost everything greater than 200 million predictions. Um, and there's a specific separate database where you can um, look all these up. But these are all predicted as monomers. And so a lot of stuff we work on is multimeric. So multiple copies of the protein work together. Um, and that is not, they haven't basically scanned all the multimeric space of 200 million. That would be quite a lot, I guess. But um, we by now use the high performance computing uh, cluster here in St. Andrews. But when we started with stuff like that, um, I used Colabfold and I, if you're interested, I can only recommend people to test it. It's really um, very easy, so I could do it, and I'm not a not a um, kind of protein modeler for sure. So um, you basically there's a Nature Methods paper, um, and there there's a GitHub page. There's lots of documentation, but in principle, you can just Google yourself um, a structure prediction. Uh, the whole computational power is actually provided. Uh, uh, by Google, there's just a fair use policy and they'll kick you out after a couple of hours um, if you don't pay, but um, that usually is sufficient to just get a structure of the system you're interested in, unless it's too big. So um, that, that's then always a problem. So, but there should all, and that is basically a contrast to three, four years ago, you should always be able to obtain at least from a substructure from what you look at, um, a, a, a prediction, a actual coordinates to model on. Um, whereas um, a couple of years ago, uh, you, it would have been more or less a random guess or much more difficult and much more um, brains involved in having actually a good prediction of, um, of the structure of the system. You look at. So when I have the structure, when I have the coordinates, I need to put on my spin label. And this is a non-exclusive list. I just talk about what we use here. There's other approaches, but um, what's probably easiest for users is MTSL wizard. That's now server-based. Um, you upload your structure, you enter a web form where you want your labels, and it will basically try to put a label on. And then you can analyze for how many does it label um, and um, uh, can, can look at distance distributions. We used MMM, that's from the uh, Gonayeshka lab, um, MATLAB based. Uh, the new version reference on the website is MMMX. I personally haven't used it, but I uh, trust it basically greatly expands. The functionality is scriptable, so that, that, is, that is very good. And we recently started using uh, Kylib from, from the Stoll lab, and that's in Python, scriptable, uh, allows basically to mimic MTSL wizard and, uh, and the Rotomer um, library approach. And it's also scriptable and um, allows you sort of uh, to, to do batch jobs labeling every potential side of your protein if you, if you want so. So the output of this will tell you, is it difficult or easy to label a site? So that obviously should inform the decision-making process if you try to label a site. It should also tell you um, um, if um, uh, the, the distance distribution between multiple sites, if you do pulse sample spectroscopy, as I presume here. And it is obviously worthwhile multi um, scanning multiple sites. And that's why the scriptable versions are becoming uh, quite interesting because you don't have to tediously kind of go through the hundreds of residues of your protein, but you can basically just um, kind of hit go, have a coffee, come back, um, or in the worst case, come back later and have a look at the output. So um, that means with predicted structures and this treasure trove of um, modeling approaches, you basically can predict if a site will label. There's no guarantee that the prediction holds true, but you can do so and you can predict distance distributions. And that allows you then 
to test, for example, if you have two different structural states you want to look at, um, which would be the points where between the two states, the difference in distance distribution is greatest, might make sense to label there unless you have an indication why this wouldn't be good kind of biologically um, or for the function of the system. So now we have decided what we do is we do the mutagenesis. So this here is kind of the, the plasmid DNA where, you, where your gene is on. That is basically then put into cells. You make sure that you actually um, have the incorporation of the, of the right DNA with the right mutation. Then you put this um, into, into a large scale protein um, um, kind of gene expression to produce a protein. Um, that is then usually with some chromatography system purified. And then basically you just check that you have the pure protein uh, in the in the way you want it. And um, obviously that protein then isn't labeled. And in this case, actually, I, sh I should have also put a couple here. In this case, here, this is GB1 that on the one side has a cysteine, on the other side has a double histidine, and you put then the MTSL on, and you put then the copper NTA on, and then you have two spins on your system um, as, as, as you want. So that kind of the, the general workflow. Um, but before that, what we would do is we would put the whole computational workflow in kind of getting a structure, what, what label to put where, what would, what would be the information we get from that. So um, we need, what, what are the conditions for the sample? Well, we want high quality data for robust analysis. And uh, that means we want to run methods that allow accessing zero time that has to do with some sort of robustness of, of processing. So that would be, um, um, for the double resonance spelled methods, the four pulse deer, for the um, rhythm, which we do a lot, the five pulse rhythm, um, or the um, for, for if you have can excite your whole spectrum uh, with try to label something like that, the six pulse DQC. So our echo decay depends. So one thing to remember here for, for dipolar methods is we are transverse magnetization all the time, or most of the time, or the dipolar window is, is transverse magnetization. And there, the echo decay depends uh, basically on the instantaneous diffusion. So the unintended flip under our refocus pulses of nearby spins that makes them them um, our spin to, to kind of phase out of the um, out of the echo molecular dynamics that basically increase the property to relaxation time and proton spin diffusion. So there are several aspects here that the instantaneous diffusion depends on the concentration, but not on the temperature. The molecular dynamics depend on the temperature and not on the concentration and proton spin diffusion depend on concentration um, and type of the protons. So basically the nice thing is this makes the, these problems largely independent. And so for the concentration that's basically taken from, from um, this uh, Polyacheski review uh, that, that I recommend to everyone who's basically starting out with, um, with these distance measurements um, because it's quite insightful. The concentration should be uh, below um, this value, which for 10 microseconds, time window, which is sufficient for most things and not really achievable in many, and 30% and uh, modulation depth, this is still beyond um, 0.3 millimolar or 300 micromolar. So for protein people, this is a pretty high concentration, and um, this here is a pretty long time window. So concentration is, with today's sensitivity in a, in a commercial Cuban system, uh, actually not really limiting. Yeah, so you would always take almost as much concentration um, as you can. But if you work, work in model systems or have a, I'm almost said pathological case where you want to have a huge time window, so it's worth um, revisiting this. So the temperature um, has a behavior that the phase memory time usually reaches a low temperature maximum for nitroxide at Q at X band that's commonly 50 Kelvin. And if you lower the temperature below that point, what will happen is you will gain in Boltzmann, but T1 will feel eternal. So T1 becomes very, very slow. And so it's recommended if you use a new type of spin label where you're not sure about this or don't know about this data, that um, you record actually um, temperature dependent um, uh, echo, echo decays that you can estimate the uh, the phase memory time and also inversion recovery or your favorite measure, method to measure T1. And what that would lead to is that you can then 
calculate this factor from this equation for each temperature that has basically a high temperature approximation for Boltzmann, um, the transverse decay, and what you gain through the averaging rate. And that turns out is um, you, your for nitroxide usually good at, um, uh, at, at 50 to 60 Kelvin. Um, for tritons, it can be higher. For metals, it's commonly much lower. Um, what we also need to do because of these protons, and um, there's been work to 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 untangle this, um, um, published by by the by the Stoll group. But I'm really just going for the fundamental logical. If you have your protein in deuterated buffer, which is fairly easy to achieve, then you usually, especially for exposed spin labels, extend your phase memory time by quite a bit, and with that, the signal quality. What we also need is cryoprotectant. This is sometimes debated, but uh, because it's kind of for, um, could impair biological function, but what we measure practically in water and water crystallizes when it freezes. And any chemist who knows recrystallization knows that crystals purify by crystallizing and all kind of contaminant in the crystal will be pushed to the crystal boundaries. For us, that means that our spin labeled molecules will bunch up at the boundaries of the water crystals. And we have huge local concentrations and bad TM. So we need to cryoprotectant and we need that deuterated because, again, we don't want to introduce additional protons. Um, and if you, again, want a very long time window, what you want to do is you want to deuterate your protein if it is at all possible. There are systems where deuteration isn't possible. There, these new multipulse um, versions, um, um, which which kind of um, use um, different different approaches and multiple pump pulses, uh, become become interesting. But for for my purpose here is uh, the more deuteration you get in, the better. That that is usually um, for um, an extended TM, and the TM is really um, required for for long distances. If you measure short distances, uh, two, three, four nanometers, that's probably not uh, not critical. But I think everything that has been convincingly measured eight nanometers and and above uh, was in in per deuterated systems. How do we analyze the data? Again, a non-exclusive list of things we use in the lab. There's other approaches. I'm not saying they're, um, they're not worthwhile. I'm just saying we haven't used them. So um, what we have most experience with is kind of DIR analysis. It has a relatively low entry barrier because it's kind of a um, GOI driven, well-tested. And by now, the latest version also includes DIRNet comparative DIR analyzer. Um, this comparative DIA analyzer also performs standalone um, analysis, and I this here is basically an, an older slide, can act as reality check. I should actually say should act as a reality check, because that is basically, if you're a crystallographer, or if you publish a paper with a small molecule inside, then uh, a crystal of that, then editors will want you to do a chef, uh, check TIFF, if basically the analysis of that raw data for the crystal is kind of sensible. And for to me, this is a similar thing for PDS data. Um, if you basically uh, have this as a sanity check, if what people do when they kind of treat their data is um, is realistic or not. DIRNet uh, from Ilya Kuprov, that's kind of the neural network driven system that is um, in the comparative D analyzer automatically compared um, that is uh, really interesting, copes well with truncated traces uh, and noise um, is um, absolutely worthwhile testing. And finally, the, the uh, Deer Lab, which is kind of uh, fully scriptable in Python, that is very interesting if you go to more complicated models, if you want to fit multiple data, if you want to look at um, more complicated experiments, kind of if you uh, have the, what I shouldn't call, but what often is addressed as an artifact from other pathways in the in the system and so on and so on. That's all in there. So there, um, it's recommended um, to explore all the, all these. But for the for the people who are starting out, what I would say is it's absolutely worthwhile to use the comparative de analyzer, and I would say run your data through that. Um, if your final analysis comes to a different point, um, then I think
think every one of us should address why in their in their paper or in their presentation because then you might you might have good reasons you might have orientation selection you might have um uh, all sorts of things going on that are not kind of in the standard analysis model um and if that's well addressed i think no one will have a problem with that but we all basically rely on that this data that comes out um is kind of robust and people um, who do structural modeling of proteins and do integrated structural biology uh, trust that EPR data is robust and reliable. So this is just an example. Actually, um, the keen eye out of, or you will actually see with the phase of zero degree that this is synthetic data. But anyways, this is um, a simulated from a distance distribution, a simulated time trace with a little bit of noise. And there you see, you get your distance distribution comparing uh, Tikhonov and Dirnet, and then basically your experiment and your fit um, and uh, basically all sorts of statistical um, or relevant uh, analysis parameters, which you don't have to calculate by hand or in your favorite um, program. So that's actually quite useful. I think that is, uh, we try and basically have these reports for each of our measurements as an attachment to the SI of stuff we publish, because I think for transparency, that's um, it's really useful. So, um, and it, you don't need to do much. You just need to open uh, the um, analysis, load your file, click automatic analysis, go, and then you get a PDF report and all output you need. And then um, that's that's the benchmark for me. So when, when we basically talk about analysis and the question what's robust and what can we rely on, I would um, really recommend everyone read the the what's called the community white paper, the benchmarking paper published um, in JAX three years ago. And basically the story is that the Shiman lab produced of this CO protein four WMTSL labeled constructs uh, split into seven samples from the same batch. So everything's the same and sent to seven labs to please measure the distance and analyze and report back without knowing what's in there and without knowing what the other labs are doing. Yeah, so, and what you see if you look at that is that these are the raw data and the background fits of the seven labs, and you see that there are clearly differences. So some people um, are more happy with, with slightly shorter traces, others are going to very long traces, signal to noise is, is slightly different. Um, so I, when I saw this first time, I wasn't sure if I should be worried or not. Or maybe I was slightly worried. But anyways, um, if you now look at the distance distributions, there's two things um, that I find um, important, yeah, really important in this. The first thing is that the mean and the width of the distance distribution or of the main peak are identical, basically, through all of them. So if you think about putting this in a structure calculation as a constraint and saying this is, in this case here, roughly centered about... Um, uh, 20 something and, um, and and basically just above 10 wide, then basically the constraint from everyone would be the same. The second thing is, if you look at things like shoulders or, or, or something like that, then you need to be more careful because the differences between the individual analysis are beyond the confidence estimates in certain points. Yeah, So just putting a confidence estimate that is above zero, which we would normally hope then you have definite intensity there. That's in many cases for this year at 65 or 67, but in some cases it's not. So the interpretation of the shape of distance distributions, especially when it comes to multiple distances and so on, is way trickier than basically just going with the mean and width. Now that's the, the important point, point I would say here. Um, and for anything on how to measure these things, how to analyze them. Um, they're, they're, I think this is the most up-to-date up to best practice guide. So if, if you use these methods and haven't read it, I uh, recommend you do so. Right. So <clears throat> in terms of structure and dynamics, I want to keep this simple, just with some data from, from our lab. Um, if you have a rigid rock-like protein, like this um, GB1 here, which is... Uh, used by NMR um, people uh, quite a lot and other EPR groups as well. Um, that uh, is a nice model system. And then you basically put spin labels on. What you see here on the right is modeling based on a static protein structure. 
um, and only taking into account the different approaches of modeling the rotamers. And what you see is that the modeling is already almost wider than the experiment. So that means to good approximation, we can say in that case, um, there is no dynamics of the protein in frozen solution. Well, there will be some, but um, we it, there is no conformer distribution. We can, in good approximation, treat this as a single conformer. Well, in other cases, like, like this data here, um, for this system, which has a single-stranded DNA binding protein uh, sitting, sitting on single-stranded DNA, and two of the proteins sit there, and they're not really kind of connected to each other, but just basically on the same string. So this is become very flexible. And when you freeze it out, you get a broad distribution. So in these cases where you have um, very wide um, distribution, that points to heterogeneous distribution of conformers in solution. And so I would really break it down to the fact if your distribution with is covered by a single conformer modeling, then you're probably really um, in a good approximation working with a single conformer. Otherwise, you basically need to sort of uh, take into account or consider uh, backbone heterogeneity, if that makes sense. So if you if you do this, that's something we played over last summer with. If you do this more extensively and now pair, this is still GB1, but you now pair a double histidin motif with a cupper where I told you this is very rigid. And on the other side, you, you basically put different nitroxides. What you then see, black is the experiment, and that is bimodal here, but the different predictions point in a different way. And um, it seems, again, here black is bimodal, and here black is bimodal, and the predictions point in different ways. And that we interpret that as some of the labels basically sticking out in solution, and some interact with the uh, surface of the um, surface of the um, helix. And the surface of the helix interaction isn't covered very well by an excluded volume modeling approach, but it is by the energy weighting of a Leonard-Jones potential you have in a, in, a, in a rotomer model. And so our conclusion is that if um, the ambiguity between the modeling might actually be an indicator to point to a difficult labeling site. So it might be worthwhile to actually use different approaches and then see, and if they agree, you. I believe safer um, that you won't have uh, ambiguous label distributions, which don't tell you anything about the protein structure. They just tell you that your labels behave in a way odd and complicate your system. So if I can um, avoid that, that is obviously um, a, a preference. So um, the the thing we did about the um, about the trito labeling was not for in cell, but basically came from the fact that. We still work a lot with rectangular pulses and then uh, nitroxide at cube and I only invert um, a, a quarter or a third of the line and a trital I could invert fully. So the uh, hypothesis was that I should get three to four times higher sensitivity uh, than I do with, with MTSL. And then the, um, uh, we do this in Rhythmy paired with a copper here. And this is the modeling of the of this trital spin label uh, from, from the... Um, from the Schumann group, and basically then uh, playing with a little bit with eking out everything out of the Rhythmy um, over a weekend, we could actually measure a 10 nanomolar sample. Um, I don't recommend this if you don't have to, but I basically will basically trying to push um, kind of the, our personal concentration race to the bottom. I think that's uh, at the moment kind of the, for a solution measurement, the lowest I've seen in literature. Um, so these trital things can actually boost sensitivity um, quite a bit um, if you if you need it. So um, almost out of time, I'll just show you a couple of examples um, where we tested a hypothesis with pulse dipolar spectroscopy. And um, the, these are all very recent ones, which, which I thought um, I, I quite useful. So the first one is from the White Lab here in St. Andrews, and they work on um, kind of uh, antiviral de defense of bacteria. So the CRISPR system you might have heard of for gene editing, but um, this is really about ancient immunity. And the what all of these um, do is after binding of cyclic nucleotides um, as a signaling molecule, they initiate some sort of defense to make sure um, the, the, um, the bacterial colony isn't overwhelmed. And so this is a... Um, Helicase basically, which does a conformational change upon binding of this signaling molecule. And they had 
um, low resolution crystal structure of the of the unbound form and high resolution crystal structure of the bound form. And the question was, um, can we bootstrap this with EPR? Is there really the conformational change or is this kind of something with kind of the crystallization conditions and so on? And so because this system is a parallel um, homodimer and what you have is at the top um, this this orange domain, which which just turns basically by ninety degree on activation. If you label in between a a, a strand, uh, the two, um, so you have a you have a dimer. So if you put in one label, you get two labels, but they're in symmetric positions. And so basically, it turns out that these distances do not change because you basically just measure across um, when when it uh, when it turns. So what we needed to introduce was actually to get better resolution of this is two labels and these labels at 85 and 209, they come much closer when the thing turns. You see that actually already in the CW, you see that also uh, in the pulse data that this distance here, which is the, um, which is the uh, intermonomer distances and the cross distances, they all stay the same, whereas this, the, uh, which is model as the 85 to 09, uh, they, that, is, that is kind of reduced when I, when I add the uh, cyclic nucleotide here. And so you see actually the agreement between the model and the experiment isn't too great. There's uh, uh, almost half a nanometer offset, but the trend is uh, reproduced very well. And so the hypothesis that I have a conformational change that was indicated by the crystal structure, but can we trust the crystal structure? We could clearly confirm there is a conformational change under the conditions. So that was that was good. And um, something that just came out, which we did with the um, with the with the same with the same lab with a few other people, is um, the the protein CSX23, and that is supposed to bind the cyclic nucleotide and not just do a conformational change. It's a different cyclic nucleotide, but never mind. But this is actually supposed to uh, kill um, the bacterium. So if it dies, then the infection cannot um, cannot spread. So, and that it does probably by disrupting the membrane. And so this system is a tetramer, and in the course of the work, they managed to crystallize the soluble part up here, but the transmembrane part that um, didn't crystallize. So this is a this is an alpha fold prediction, and the alpha fold prediction is a tetramer, and you can basically put this in MMM or MTSL wizard, and you get actually two distances here, as you would expect for a tetramer. So if you if you think of a square and you put a, a label on each vertex then you have two times the short distance and one times the long distance. And that's what we actually see here, two short and long distances by differing by a square root of two as kind of is a, uh, in the resulting triangle, the length of the hypotenuse over, um, over the short A side here. Um, so that actually uh, works quite well. And when you actually add the cyclic nucleotide, what you see is a huge broadening of the thing, which indicates that um, the thing becomes much more uh, conformationally flexible and fluid, and it might be actually the confinement in the nano disk that it doesn't find other partners to make a big pore. But that is basically the hypothesis was there is something happening, conformational change um, in the in, in the um, in the protein when it's inserted in the membrane, and that is actually what what we could could confirm here. And as a final example, something rather different, which we uh, did publish last year. Um, well, we don't have a prediction of a structure, but actually a prediction of a, um, a very uh, sort of, let's say, uh, non-structured region. So this is a, a blood protein that interacts with a lot of factors, is important to store um, your, um, your zinc levels that they're not in the plasma because they would be toxic and might lead to blood clotting and you don't want to have blood clotting in your blood vessels, you want your blood clotting when you, when you have a cut somewhere. Um, and so the, the, this protein is, uh, we couldn't, for, for technical reasons, uh, make recombinantly. Um, so this is a native protein, but it has a lot of histidines, which are presumably binding zinc or copper. And we wanted to basically know, um, is a preferential structure or is this prediction more or less true that everything is floppy and flexible? And if you then basically just put in copper, you and, and and look at the um, raw or uh, background corrected um, Peldor data here, um, you see that the modulation depth increases, but this is all broad. So this 
really speaks for very flexible, but you can actually, in a system where you don't get structural information out of the modulation depth and the model for that, get out actually how many high affinity sites you have that you are occupied. And in that case, we could then use hyperfine spectroscopy. So um, EDNMR, um, three parts ESIM and high score to show that actually for all the cuppers which are supposedly binding to the high affinity side, the spectra don't change. So the basically binding sites are all identical, which says basically this uh, disordered sponge uh, binding everything that is actually uh, quite a good model for that. And that, that the hypothesis is that basically that um, allows to then gain structure upon binding of metal ions and, and, and binding partners. So that was basically just the survey I wanted to do today. Uh, I hope it, someone there who found it useful. So bin labeling allows to introduce different paramagnetic centers specifically into the sequence of proteins. The AI revolution allows structural modeling of any protein and prediction of suitable sites. So that is really, I think, um, really a game changer. So you can now look, look at a lot of different things and um, when you work with biologists, now everyone has a predicted structure um, of their favorite protein. And for us, this can really serve as a, um, as a blueprint to design uh, the experiments around. Um, we need to be careful that we don't impede on the natural structure and function. So it's always important to think about how we can prove that. Um, and that showed you that we have a treasure trove of both methods and uh, 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 and, and analysis and modeling tools that are freely available. And uh, I think a final point is um, the more specific and detailed you can be from the outset in phrasing your question, your hypothesis, in terms of not what happens, but is it really a transition of that structure to that structure that, that, that will allow you to discriminate uh, models much more confidently. And with that, I would like to thank my group, the guys in physics who keep the Cuban humming, the collaborators whose work I mentioned, and um, the funders, obviously, and you for your attention. Well, thank you for that very nice presentation. And the floor is now open for questions uh, from the audience. If anyone has any questions, just feel free to unmute your microphone and, and step right in. Tomas, go ahead. Um, yeah, I have a very, uh, a very naive question, actually, um, since I'm not an expert on the topic, but uh, basically you said that T1 is critical for 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 your measurements and uh, you said that the deuteration of the protein is one of the strategy you use to increase the T1 if I uh, well that, if I said that that was a mistake so it's, ah, okay. it's TM so TM, TM T1 okay. yeah TM so phase memory time so T1 Sorry. is largely is largely um temperature dependent and that's why we need to play with the temperature okay yeah. So yeah. Sorry, I, probably was my mistake. In that it was it was TM, and uh, so deuteration is uh, is to increase the TM, uh, and you did deuterate the protein. So are there other strategies you can use, like uh, playing with the matrix, or 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 it doesn't does it? Yeah. So I think the stuff? matrix is more or less standard. So there is now people going into different systems. Um, proteins that phase separate and so on. Then that's also very difficult to do. But if you have, um. So it's really kind of having close by, not the very close by, but reasonably close by protons. So you see, for example, differences if you have a spin label that is sticking out into solution and the solution is deuterated, D2O exchanged, that gets a longer TM than one that's more buried and has proteins, uh, protons from the protein around. And that basically has a, has a slower TM, yeah? a faster TM. Is, um, yeah, so lower number for TM. So um, what if we do what's the standard because samples are small and D2O isn't that expensive, um, we exchange the buffers for deuterated buffers and the cryoprotectants are fairly expensive. But if you think about the instrument time and kind of and so on and so on, it's still um, the cryoprotectant is also largely deuterated. 
but to make the protein deuterated is complicated because you need now to basically have the bacteria which make your protein feed on deuterated nutrients and so on and so on. And um, remember that we do site-directed spin labeling. So in contrast to what an NMR spectroscopist might do, um, for every experiment, we have a new sample. So if you want to measure 30 pairs, if you want to, then you need to make 30 samples and then the deuteration of the protein becomes a cost factor. All right, thank you. Just to add on to that question, is this um, somehow also an advantage of using the, the tridal uh, molecules for spin labels because they're more isolated from the, the protons from the solvent or does that not play a role really? Um, I haven't, I haven't seen that, that there is a, I haven't, I haven't looked at this in detail. I haven't seen that there is a huge increase. Tridal, I mean, that is then temperature wise. If you think about native conditions and room temperature, then at a certain point, the nitroxides, um, well, higher than the metal centers, but the nitroxides just fall off a cliff and the <laughs> relaxation times become just, um, uh, impossible. Uh, unless you basically do something to have, avoid the methyl rotation. Um, there's people working on that as well. So the trital becomes very interesting, especially at higher temperatures um, uh, and room temperature experiments with tritals um, have been done. Whereas with nitroxides, it becomes very difficult because of the, 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 the fast rotation. So that, that is clearly an advantage of the tritals, yes. And I think you said it during the talk, but I, I missed the actual the exact number. What is the what is the line width that you're seeing with these um, trital labels? Um, it depends on the specific trital labels and if there there's kind of proton hyperfine couplings that you can resolve. For us, I I couldn't tell you couldn't tell you the number, uh, but for us, basically with a typical um, kind of. 816 or 1224 detection sequence that covers the bandwidth of the spectrum, right? Which which oh, you okay. wouldn't do in a nitroxide. Yeah. So I mean Absolutely. that on a, on a, on that um, on that level, where kind of we sure. can calculate that the 12 nanosecond pi pulse at qubit inverts, I don't know, 40 percent or something from of a of a nitroxide, yeah. and that we have covered fully. Sure. Certainly an advantage there. Um, other questions from the audience? No? Okay, um, I'll just ask um, maybe another question. Uh, so I have, it's probably naive, but I have very little experience with spin labeling, but some experience with the tritals. And so I'll ask again uh, a question concerning this. Do you, do you also try to like, um, get get oxygen out of solution to to increase or to decrease the line width, or once you um, encaps or encompass the entire line width in your bandwidth, you don't care anymore. Well, at that point, we we didn't uh, we didn't care, and as I think the I mean the we we did quite some trials for nitroxides, especially in membranes and so on, years ago, where we wanted to know if the if the oxygen is actually relevant for at the temperatures for the pulse dipolar spectroscopy. But I think the conclusion back then was if we're at temperatures like 50 or 30 K or so, that the oxygen, so the relaxivity of the oxygen isn't, isn't, uh, is kind of in the, um, not dominant, it's not dominant contributing factor to, to the, um, to the phase memory time. Thank you. Okay. Ask again for questions from the audience before we close. Um, last chance, anyone? I don't see any hands ra hand raised. So um, if not, I'll just say uh, thank you again to our speaker for this uh, very lovely seminar. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And I hope that um, all of you will tune in in two weeks for our next speaker. Uh, look out for those emails uh, coming from me at the end of next week for a reminder. Uh, thank you all, and I wish you all uh, a great rest of your day or all of your day if you're in the morning or evening or what have you. Um, thank you and take care. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Bella. Yeah, yeah super cool. All right. Yeah.
Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, no worries. No worries. Okay. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.